My name is Ryan Paul, and I teach history here at SUU, and I am the director of Apex. And on behalf of myself and the Apex team, uh, Amelia Nauman and Sophia Javage, I want to welcome you to History, Healing, and Restoriation. I'd also like to thank the Eccles Visiting Scholar Fund and the Provost's Office for making this event possible. I'd like to remind you that today's conversation will continue this afternoon at 3 p.m. on Thunder 91.1 and on the Apex Radio Hour podcast. Darren Perry is the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Darren serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center in Wellsville, Utah, the Utah Humanities Board, and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. He attended the University of Utah and Weber State University and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis on history. Darren is the author of The Bear River Massacre, a Shoshone history, and teaches Native American history at Utah State University. His passions in life are his wife, Melody, seven children, and 17 grandchildren. His other passion is his tribal family. He wants to make sure that those who have gone before him are not forgotten. As a note, we do have copies of Mr. Perry's book, The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History, for purchase in the lobby. And after today's event, Mr. Perry will be happy to sign, have a book signing after the presentation. So now it is my pleasure to welcome Darren Perry to Southern Utah University and the Apex stage. This has got to be the most beautiful venue I've ever spoken at. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> if you were to drive north along Highway 91, just past Preston, Idaho, you'll round a curve that opens to a panoramic view of the Bear River bottomlands below. If you know where to look, you can still see the steam rising from the edges. 158 years ago, it was at that exact spot that some 700 members of my Shoshone people were wintering, as they had done for centuries. It was a welcome place for them to catch their breath, see family and friends. We called this place Moso de Guani, which means home of the lungs. A half a mile to the east, Patrick Edward Connor, and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, had the same bird's eye view on that early January morning in 1829, 1863, I'm sorry, as they made their way down a ravine towards a sleeping Indian village. When something terrible happens, where human lives are lost, that place always seems to take on a new meaning the 14.6 acres of the World Trade Centers, the beaches of Normandy, a homemade memorial at the site of the road where a fatal traffic accident occurred, places that haunt and hurt for the wounds that they hold, but they still compel us to go back for some unexplainable comfort. For hundreds of years, the banks of the Bear River provided a warm wintering campground for my people. We called this place Bo Ogai, which means big river. The river's hot springs offered warmth and renewal and healing, and winters were always relaxing and joyful. It was the elders' time to tell stories, but that peace was shattered on that morning by Patrick Connor as his California volunteers invaded that campsite and killed everyone they encountered. We believe more than 400 Shoshones lost their lives that day, with two thirds of that number being women and children. Have you ever had a memory sneak out of your eye and roll down your cheek? I have that all the time when I think about the massacre of my people. Over the years, the banks of Bo Ogai became a place of honor 
where those bodies still lie today. Frozen ground, fear of returning soldiers, prevented those few survivors from properly burying their dead. That site remains a sacred burial ground to those victims lost on that cold morning. But their voice still speaks to me from the dust. If you're there at just the right time in the evening, my grandmother would tell me, you can sit and you can hear the cries of the little ones crying for their mothers. You don't have to see things as they were to know that a terrible injustice had taken place. You can feel it. But we remember and we honor the past because it allows us to move on and succeed in the future. Someone once told me, never let your past negative experiences harm your future. Your past cannot be altered, and your future certainly doesn't need the punishment. In the years that followed, the story of the so-called battle of Bear River was always told from the soldier's perspective. But I knew this was no battle, and my grandmother, Mae Timbimbu Perry, knew it too. One day she sat me down and she said, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. One day, you will have to make them listen. My people were hunters and gatherers. We traveled with the changing seasons. The Shoshones refer to themselves as Niwa, which means the people. We looked upon the earth as not just a place to live, but something so sacred and special that we called her mother. She was always the provider of our livelihoods. You see to native people, the mountains and the streams and the plains stand forever and seasons walk around annually. We traveled to different areas when the game was plentiful and the seeds and berries were abundant. If you can imagine, it was a hard way of life probably never more than a couple of days away from starvation. But it was a happy life. Back then, every member of the tribe played an important role in its survival. That family relationship was sacred. In the summer of 1847, Sagwich, our chief, who happens to be my third great-grandfather, received word that there was a group of white settlers making their way towards the Salt Lake Valley. And on July 31st, Sagwich traveled to Salt Lake City to try to meet with Brigham Young and the first group of pioneers. He didn't meet with Brigham Young that day. He instead met with a man named Heber C. Kimball. At the conclusion of that meeting, Heber C. Kimball said this, you do not own the land. The land belongs to the Lord and we calculate to plow and plant it. If you can imagine, within months, disputes arose between the pioneers and the Shoshone over the land and the, what my grandmother called the payment of rent. Sagwich's life was now going to get complicated. Over the next few years, as more and more saints arrived to the Salt Lake Valley, good land was now becoming scarce. It was then that the church sent a man named Peter Mon north to settle the Cache Valley for good, where I live today. This would have a devastating effect on my people because not long after, other saints would soon arrive to that beautiful valley. In those early days, the saints referred to Sagwich and his people as the friendly ones. As more and more saints arrived and resources began to become scarce, those same saints referred to my people as thieves and beggars, which was probably true from their perspective. The irony, though, for me, is that the saints themselves had so, suffered so much hate and injustice on their trek across this country. It's hard for me to believe that they could be found guilty of doing the same thing to my people. 
Peter Mon, who is now the area authority, said this. With extraordinarily good luck, the California volunteers will completely wipe them out. We wish this community rid of all such parties. And if Colonel Connor can be successful in reaching that bastard class of humans who play with the lives of the peaceable and the law-abiding citizens in this way, we shall be pleased to acknowledge our obligations. With this development, the use of the California and Oregon trails that also cut through the heart of Shoshone land, I think our people had three options. Beg for food, starve, or steal. You now have two different groups of people living two very different lifestyles. In early January, of 1863, the Mormon saints in the Cache Valley and those using the Oregon and California trails began writing letters to Salt Lake City for someone to come take care of the Indian problem. Arrest warrants were issued for Sagwich, Chief Bear Hunter, and Pocatello. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers were now mustered into service. A Mormon scout named Porter Rockwell led Connor and his men just north of Logan, Utah today, near Preston, Idaho, where Battle Creek meets Boa Ogai. Sagwich, being an early riser, got up as usual on the morning of the 29th. He looked outside his lodge and surveyed the area. He noticed to the southeast a steaming mist on the bluff, which started to creep down the hill. The chief, what he saw was the horses, 220 cavalry, had been traveling all night in zero degree temperatures, four feet of snow. They were steaming, they were lathered up. Every time they breathed, the steam would come out. He wasn't surprised. He called his village to wake up. They gathered whatever they could find to fight with, bows and arrows. My grandmother said the women picked up their woven winnowing pans to use them for shields. Without so much as asking for the guilty party, Connor and his men began to fire their rifles at my people. But what are arrows compared to the rifles and sidearms of the soldiers? My grandmother describes it as we were being slaughtered like wild rabbits. The massacre started early in the morning and lasted until early afternoon. The Bear River, which was slightly frozen sometimes earlier, was now starting to flow. Many of our people were jumping into this river to try to escape. The blazing white snow was now brilliant red with blood. The willows that were used as hiding places bent down as if in defeat. Many of our women were running with their young children to jump into the river to try to escape. Almost all of them died. There was one woman in particular named Angie Chi. She was a brand new mother, a young girl. She told of running to the river with her newborn baby and jumping in where there was a hot spring, but where there was also an overhanging bank. She swam under there, and when she got there, she found herself there with 10 other women who had had the same idea. They could hear the soldiers just above their heads on the bank, wondering where they'd gone. Angie Chi lived to be more than 100 years old, and she would often tell this story to the young children who would want to listen. She told of jumping into the river with her newborn. She told of tending the seven bullet wounds that she had already had to her body. And then she told of drowning her own baby because her baby started to cry and she didn't want it to give up the location of the other people. By doing that, everyone was saved. They watched from their hiding places, tending the wounds. The cruelest killing, though, was that of Bear Hunter. They knew that he was a chief. They had shot him and stabbed him and tortured him in many ways. 
Through all of that, the old chief wouldn't die. He wouldn't even make a sound or cry out for mercy. Because of that, the military men became angry, frustrated, stepped to a burning campfire and heated their bayonet until it was glowing red. One of those men then ran that hot piece of metal through that chief's head from ear to ear. Bear Hunter went to his grave that day, a man of honor, and he left behind a wife and many small children. At the end of the massacre, Connor allowed a handful of saints, local pioneers from Franklin, to walk the field. James Martineau was sickened by what he saw. He noted in his journal that many of the squaws were killed because they would not lie down and submit to be ravished. He later told Peter Mon of sickening accounts of inhuman acts by the soldiers. He said after the Indians had been killed and wounded, many of the wounded were finished off by hitting them in the head with an ax. The next morning at the request of Brigham Young, three men from Franklin, William Head, William Nelson, and William Hull, traveled to the massacre site looking for the wounded and counting the dead. Hull later recorded in his journal, we drove our sleighs as far as the river. The first sight to greet us was an old Indian man walking with his head bowed, lamenting the dead. He didn't speak to us and he soon left walking towards the north. Never will I forget the scene. Dead bodies were everywhere. I counted eight deep in one place, and in several places there were three to five deep. All in all, the three of us counted independently 450 Shoshones dead, two-thirds of that number being women and children. We found two Indian women alive. We found one little boy and one little girl who looked to be about the age of three. The little girl was badly wounded, having received eight bullet wounds to her tiny little body. We took them on our horses to the sleigh and made them as comfortable as possible. At this time, I can't imagine, but Chief Sagwich must have realized that he was indeed living in two different worlds. One group was greedy, wanted everything, especially the land. The other group only wanted to live and travel as they'd always done for centuries. One group made their wishes and dreams come true by making themselves the conqueror, but at the expense of a defenseless people who only wanted to be left alone. Ralph Smith, a Franklin area settler, summed up the sentiments of the local saints when he said, you know, we looked upon the massacre as gruesome, but necessary. And then added, the work of Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers was nothing less than an in intervention from our Heavenly Father. Marianne Weston Mon, wife of Peter Mon, recorded in her, her journal, the residents of Cache Valley regarded Connor's efforts as an imposition of providence in our behalf and commented that the Indians had been a source of great annoyance to us for a very long time. Henry Ballard, Bishop of the Logan Second Ward, recorded in his journal, this put a quietus upon the Indians. The Lord raised up his foe and Colonel Connor to punish them so that we didn't have to do it. We had bore a great deal from them, and yet we had still been feeding them, and yet some of the wicked spirits among them would stir up trouble against us. George Farrell, secretary of the Logan First Ward, recorded in the church's official minutes that we, the people of Cache Valley, looked upon the movement of Colonel Connor as an intervention from the Almighty God, 
as the Indians had been a source of great annoyance to us for a very long time. And finally, in a letter dated February 4th to Brigham Young from Peter Mon, he said, I feel my skirts rid of their blood. They rejected the way of life and salvation, which had been pointed out to them from time to time. And thus they have perished, relying upon their own strength and wisdom. Just north of Preston, Idaho today, you will find an old monument off of Highway 91. This monument was erected in 1932 by the people of Franklin County to remember that day. This was a celebrated event. Politicians, church leaders, scout groups came together to share their common history. What that monument really does for me is I believe it gives people a reason to forget. That monument strips us of our obligation to find out for ourselves what took place. And that monument tells us how it wants the past to be remembered. You see, we as humans have great memories for what we want to remember. In commemorating the battle, you focus on the uglier parts of history. And you only focus on the heroism of the soldier and the saint. And that's the kind of Daughters of Utah Pioneers monument that exists there today. But that narrative now becomes the story. It's not a story about my people. It becomes a story about the brave soldiers and the pioneer women who took care of them after. In constructing a monument like this, you firm up memory and you create what I think is a false history. You decide. The plaque reads, attacks by the Indians on the peaceful inhabitants in this vicinity led to the final battle here on January 29th in 1863. The conflict occurred in deep snow and bitter cold. Scores of wounded soldiers were taken from the battlefield to the Latter-day Saint community of Franklin, Idaho. Here, pioneer women, trained through trials and necessities of frontier living, accepted the responsibility of caring for the wounded soldiers until they could be removed to Camp Douglas, Utah. Two Indian found alive, two Indian women found alive after the encounter were given homes in Franklin. So my question to you is, is that really what happened? The problem of this narrative for me, and it's one of many, is that it gives us one point of view from one generation's perspective, 69 years after the event. It's like a view from a window that has been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of a beautiful landscape. You only get to see what they want you to see. It reinforces the view that violence on the, front, on the frontier was necessary for the survival of Mormon communities. And it goes so far as to show what the consequences would be if both groups tried to share the same land. What if the plaque had been written from the perspective of the Shoshone people? Would it have read the same way? Maybe it would have said something like this. The massacre of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone's occurred in this vicinity on January 29th. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, attacked a sleeping Indian village in the early morning hours of that day. The soldiers shot, raped, bludgeoned, and bayoneted several hundred men, women, and children to their death. The Indians fought back with the limited weapons available to them, but the band was all but annihilated. So my question is, which version of the massacre is correct? The answer will lie in your perspective. 
The events that took place on that cold January morning have long been forgotten by most if you've even ever heard of it. Maybe guilt or remorse has silenced all those who one day may have wanted to know the truth. I hope there's a new generation of people, though, that have a desire to listen and to learn. And it's not because we're looking to have things made right. We're not. But I believe that those who died at Bear River have a God-given right to be heard. Their voice speaks to me from the dust. We remember and we honor the past because it allows us to succeed in the future. I am grateful that past negative experiences didn't alter Chief Sagwich's future because as his descendant, it would have altered mine. The most successful Native Americans today, I believe, are those who can best balance culture and change. We honor our culture. We honor those who have gone before. We honor them and their traditions. They are important to us. But as a tribal leader, I realize that we live in an ever-changing world. And it's my job to prepare our youth to change and succeed with it. The massacre at Boa Ogai has taught me many lessons over the years that I'd like to share with you. It's taught me that bad things happen to people. How we respond to those bad events will determine our character and who we become. It has taught me to offer unconditional forgiveness but it doesn't mean I need to forget. It has taught me that as we preserve history and memorialize history, that all views are to be represented and respected. It has taught me that everyone has a story worthy of being told. What is your story going to be? Because your stories are equally as important as mine. And it has taught me that the souls of my ancestors peer out from behind my mask of skin and that through my memories, they get to live again. Ultimately, the story of Bear River is our story. And in some ways, I hope you can respect the story that we want to have told as well as recognize your role within that story. You see, history doesn't always affirm us. Sometimes history challenges us to think about an uglier past that we would all rather not have. But you know what? That's really the power and the benefit of history. It connects us to the past. It connects us to our humanity and our inhumanity. But it always offers us a way to move forward especially in a circumstance like this with the Shoshones, moving forward in a way that connects us not in the prettiest of ways, but to move forward to a new relationship that I like to call a 21st century relationship based on respect. Respect for the truth and what happened in that past moment. Then, that is when you get the possibility for reconciliation. But how do you make reconciliation possible in such a seemingly divided world that we live in today, where the world tells us that we all have individual rights and to go ahead and get ahead at all costs versus indigenous obligations and values that teach us that we all have obligations Obligations to the past, present, and future. Obligations to each other and our community. I often think about the values of my native people and what lessons of life that they can teach us today. Values that strengthen our community. Values that give the most marginalized people in our community a voice values that teach us to cherish our likenesses but celebrate the heck out of our differences.
to honor our stewardship for this earth and all things that live on it and the sky above it. They would tell us to have gratitude for what we have, for those who make the trails for us to follow. And they would tell us to have reverence in our hearts. They would tell us to spread the kind of love that awakens the soul, that makes each one of us reach for more that plants the fire in our hearts and brings peace to our minds. That's the kind of love this world needs today. Love, kindness, forgiveness, acceptance. I see you, I hear you, and I accept you. Those affirmations and many more like them are what I like to call medicine words. I hope we can speak medicine words to those around us, but especially to our young people. Words that bless, empower, and inspire. When we speak medicine words, we build unity and we strengthen our cultures, our communities, and our nation. When we see all of the Creator's children the same, we will begin to appreciate the diversity that we all bring to the table. I remember being in grade school and the teacher talking about America as the great melting pot of the world where all people are welcome. Unity and diversity was our greatest strength. And our national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one, has been our guide. So what has so drastically changed over the last six years? Are we ever going to get place back to a place of civility? I hope that one day we can get back to seeing people for who they are, rather than someone who appears to be different. As we educate ourselves, I believe we begin to create a space that will allow us all to have honest and open discussions that will allow us to talk more about the things that we have in common. Gandhi said that our greatest ability as humans is not to change the world, but to change ourselves. If you want to be a peacemaker and a bridge builder in your community, that process begins with you. One day, a great Shoshone hunter brought home a sizable kill far too much to be eaten by his family. A mountain man nearby asked the hunter how he was going to store the excess because drying and storing technologies were well known. Store the meat, the hunter said, why would I do that? Instead, the hunter sent out an invitation for the whole village to come together for a great feast. At the conclusion of that evening, after they danced around the fire and ate until every last morsel was consumed, they went their ways. The mountain man was really puzzled. And he again went to the hunter and said, given the uncertainty of fresh meat in the forest, it would have been far wiser for you to share the meat for future use. For your family. Store the meat, the hunter said. I store the meat in the belly of my brother. As we become successful by today's standards, can I make one suggestion? I hope that our status in this life will not be determined by how much we accumulate, but by how much we give away and how much we do for each other in our individual communities. Years ago, the anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But no, Mead said the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture 
was a femur bone that had been broken and healed. Mead explained to the students that in the animal kingdom, if you break a leg, you die. You could outrun from danger. You can't get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat for a prowling beast. No animal survives a broken bone long enough for it to heal. A broken femur bone that healed shows evidence that someone has taken the time to stay with the one who fell, that bound up their wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended that person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. We are at our very best as humans when we are serving others. The answers to racism, prejudice, discrimination, and hate will not come from government, law enforcement, schools, and yes, even religion. Solutions will come as we open our hearts to those whose lives are very different from our own, as we work to build genuine bonds of friendship, and as we begin to see each other as brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends. The wheels of justice should move the same for all of us. Dr. King said again, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. It's that kind of love that should inspire all of us to do the rigorous work of building bridges of cooperation rather than walls of segregation and division. Oneness isn't sameness in America. We must all learn to value our differences. Let me conclude with my favorite story. One day, a young girl I had just done a presentation to, she was a second grader. I made the mistake of asking her if she had a question. She looked me dead in the eye and said, how did you get to be the chief? Because apparently I don't look like chief enough. So, and I told her this story. I said, when a young Shoshone boy or girl does an act of kindness or service, the chief and the tribe would give that boy or girl one eagle feather. I then said to the girl, what do you think would happen if that boy or girl kept doing kind things for people? And she said, well, they would get more eagle feathers. I said, you're right. I then asked the little girl, what do you think would happen if that boy or girl kept doing kind things until they became an adult? And her answer was obvious. Well, by then, they would have so many eagle feathers. And I told her she was right. Then I said, one day when the chief gets ready to die, and the chief is always the chief until he dies, he will call everyone together. And he will say, I'm about to meet my maker. I need to select a new chief. I want all of you to pull out your eagle feathers and show them to me. He would then select the person that had the most eagle feathers to become the new chief. You see, the chief isn't the bravest or the toughest or the strongest. The chief is one who led a life of service and kindness to those around him or her. So my message to you, go be a chief today. Be a good sibling. Express gratitude to those around you. Be a good friend. Be the kind of person that you want to be with. Be the kind of person that you needed when you were hurt. And don't be the person that hurt you. In this way, you will become a leader in your community. Leadership that's not rooted in power and authority, but in service, kindness, and wisdom. 
I want to thank you for hosting me today, the Apex Lecture Series. Thank you for allowing me to share a message of hard history, how to reconcile that. But the message for all of us should be, how do we move forward in this world that we all live in today? Turn off the news. Go out and serve your neighbor. Get to know them. Play games with them. And this way you'll help our community grow stronger and stronger. So thank you very much.